We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report, on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program columnist for the Financial Times, visiting for professor at the London School of Economics, and author of Other People's Money, John Kay. John, welcome to the program. Good to be with you, Sam. So, uh, John, you know what I was struck, too, actually, was uh, before we actually get into the, the, the premise of, of your book, uh, was the different subtitles for Britain and the United States. And um, one is the real business of finance, and the other one is a little bit, um, uh, little bit more, I guess, uh, uh, provocative. Yeah, actually, Sam, I, I wrote the provocative one, which my British publisher was very happy with. <laughs> but the American publisher wanted uh, perhaps to make the book look a bit more, um, to give a bit more gravitas to the cover. I and think. Wh- so wait, what was the one in Britain? Because I, I, I'm confused. I, 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 what was the more provocative? Masters of the universe are servants of the people. Right. Well, you know what? I got to say that I like that one better myself. Now, that may be a, a function of my personality, but it's probably a function of my personality too. Well, but I think that really gets to the central question too of 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 your book, which is, um, you know, why why do we? What is the purpose of the financial sector? And 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 talk to us about what the financial sector is supposed to be before we get into sort of what it's become. Yeah, what I think it's supposed to be is about doing four things. One is enabling us to make payments. That's the kind of everyday utility in which we receive our wages and salaries, pay our bills, and businesses deal with each other. And that's actually what it's still true. Most people are employed in banking do, although not the people in, who are involved in banking who are paid millions of dollars a year. The second thing is we need finance to help us with wealth management. We need to manage our wealth over our lifetime, save for our retirement, make provision to pass on our wealth and other capital to future generations. Thirdly, we need finance to help with capital allocation, to take our savings and put them into the right businesses, the right houses, the right properties, to build up the capital stock of the nation from the savings of individuals. And finally, the financial sector can help us with with risk management so that we can can share some of the risks of everyday life with other people instead of having to be at the mercy of everything from relationship breakdown to Hurricane Katrina. Did did we have an era uh, in, uh, I guess, our country, your country, was there an era where the the financial sector was... um, was fulfilling those four roles optimally and I'm, not it, not going beyond that? I'm not sure it was ever fulfilling them optimally, but it was fulfilling them. Uh, that was a larger part of the activity of the finance sector than it, was today, than it is today. And the real growth of the financial sector, the process over the last 30 to 40 years, which I call financialization, is this is very largely irrelevant to these underlying needs of the real econ- of the non financial economy for finance and and so and let me ask you this too i mean to the extent that um, i mean, have have we ever all right well let's talk about the process of financialization because i mean it is um, it is both a um, it, it is both a, a, a phenomena of, I guess, size and of kind in some way, right? I mean, like we have, I mean, I, I'm quite convinced that this financialization includes a lot of what we would consider sort of tangible corporations that now have sort of a financialized side to them that is sort of more relevant in their decision-making process uh, than perhaps even the products they ultimately put out. I, th- well, I think that's right, and there are two aspects to that. One is that big corporations now typically have treasury copper operations. They're almost banking activities in their own right. And the second part, and perhaps the more fundamental point, is the way in which corporations have become more financially oriented so that there's less emphasis on asking, you know, what are the goods and services that our customers want? and more on how can we extract more value from higher shareholders. 
for our shareholders. And and I mean uh, I mean we've spoken to uh, in the past um, a guy named Bill Lazonic who has done a lot of research uh, out of uh, uh, UMass. Uh, yeah, uh, I know Bill. Well, I mean, a lot of his research is that really, at the end of the day, when you're talking about shareholder value, you're really just talking about the CEO and the board of directors. Uh, uh, well, uh, right. I think there is a key issue there, which is that one of the things that has happened in this era of financialization is the CEO and a small inner group of top executives have been enriching themselves, actually at the expense of the shareholders. And the truth is, the banking sector is the one in which that has been true on the largest scale, Uh, that actually the shareholders of banks have not done well over the last two decades, uh, but the top employees of banks have done extremely well. So what was it that led to this uh, this financialization? I mean, if we describe, the, or, or I should say even define it for us so that we really have a, a clarity, and then let's talk about what led to it over the past 40 years. What I mean by financialization is essentially the replacement of a world in which financial activity was very largely relationship-based. That is, it was where you were dealing with people People who were dealing with finance knew who they were talking to, and these were individual personalities, with one that is essentially transactions and trading-based, so that much of the activity is anonymous. You don't know who you're dealing with, uh, and uh, you're buying and selling existing assets rather than establishing and creating new ones. And so what are the implications of that? I mean, if we're not creating new assets, but people are making a lot of money on existing assets, like how, uh, how is it possible that you have uh, everyone, I guess, selling to a, a sort of a closed group of people just selling the same stuff to each other back and forth? H- how is their value created? It's a very good question, and one that puzzled me for a long time because there are two parts to it. One is how does the value cre- what is the value created? And secondly, how the profits created. Because if we lock a group of people in a room and they spend the day trading paper with each other, they're going to walk out with much the same value of paper as they did at uh, at the end, as they did at the beginning. Now, one of the things I read, that puzzled me for a long time. And I came to see that you can't create more wealth, but you can imagine more wealth. And let me give you two examples of how that's done. One is you sit in the room exchanging bits of paper with each other, and if you're passing around the paper at higher and higher prices, then everyone thinks they're making money in this process. One day, of course, someone will look at that bit of paper and say, hey, this isn't worth what it's, what it's been selling for. But until that day comes, everyone thinks they're doing pretty well. Now, that's exactly what describes, it's what's well, oversimplified, but it essentially describes what happened in 2003 to 2008 uh, when banks were trading paper with each other, announcing large profits. And then in 2008, we discovered much of this paper had not been worth what people thought it was worth. And that was a repeat of what happened in the, the great new economy bubble in 1999 and 2000. When the same thing happened, people were, um, uh, selling each other internet stocks at ever higher and higher prices. And until, until, until in 2000, people kind of woke up and say, hey, these things are not producing ever any revenue and are not going to. And the paper was, was worth very little. But it's like one of these pass-the-parcel games in which, so long as you don't open the parcel, everyone thinks they're doing well. Another way in which this happens is what I call a, a tailgating strategy. And that's... Uh, because I drive quite a lot on French auto routes. I've a house in France. And in, in France, if you drive on an auto route, uh, at, unless you're way past the leg of speed limit, you'll find someone is on your tail, flashing lights at you and trying to get you out of the way. Now, that kind of bad driving behavior pays most of the time. You know, 99% of the time, it works. It's just 1% it doesn't. And when it doesn't, something pretty terrible happens. Now, but, but if you apply a strategy like that in the finance sector, you can see that so long as it's working for you, you're congratulating yourself, you're making a lot of money. And we have a lot of strategies like that in finance, 
For example, we had a big one in Europe when people thought after the euro was formed, you could borrow money in the north of Europe and lend it in the south of Europe and make a small turn on it. People discovered one day that eventually one day the, the crash came uh, and people discovered they'd lent a lot, a lot of money to Greece and they were never going to get it back. And so, wait, so, so when you when you talk about the um, the French drivers, and you know, I got to, uh, I should, it, I guess, full disclosure, I'm probably similar in uh, in my driving uh, approach. Uh, you might get a job in finance. <laughs> well, uh, sadly, I think that ship has sailed. But, um, but, but, what, like specifically on a broad scale, like what, 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 what is that strategy? The sort of like, what does it do? I get the the scenario where everybody's sitting in a room and they're creating sort of like illusory value without actually creating anything else. I mean, maybe they're taking these pieces of paper, and at one point, the one person says, oh, I have another idea. I'm going to take this piece of paper, I'm going to cut it into 25 slices, and I'm going to sell each slice at a slight premium so that I can, you know, uh, yeah. aggregate these, or uh, I'm going to make a photocopy of this paper. It's not really the paper. It's like an image of the paper. I'm going to sell you or, or, or the right to get this piece of paper later. I get, I get that. What, but what is, what is the, the, like, in real terms, what is the, how does that, uh, car, that bad driver translate? Right. Well, well, well let, me, well, let me go back to my European example to give you a point. I borrow money in Germany at uh, 3%, and I lend it out in, Euro, uh, in Greece at 3.25%. And so long as that's working... I'm making a quarter percent every year, a nice steady stream of small profits. Suddenly, someone wakes up and discovers, uh, uh, but there's a reason why interest rates are higher in Greece than in Germany. They're higher in Greece than in Germany, because in Greece, you're a lot less certain that, that you're going to get paid back. Right, there's a risk uh, premium. That's an interest rate premium. Now, what happened was there was so much money being pushed into doing that, between 2003 and 2008, that that premium disappeared to almost nothing. So when I said it's three and a quarter in Greece and three in Germany, that's really how close it was in 2007. Now, but there's, the, you can see the risk of a Greek default is quite a bit larger than that premium applies, as we discovered in the end. But so long as that we hadn't made that discovery, everyone thought they were making money. But that that to me seems like just sort of, I guess, just bad assessment of risk, right? As opposed to something that is structurally wrong. Like the idea of, I mean, that's how banks work, right? Theoretically, is is they they borrow yeah. money from me and they give me, you know, whatever, 1% on my savings and then they loan it to you uh, at, I don't know, 3% or 4% or, or, or I mean... That it's just a question of in that instance we're talking about with with Greece, that is a a, a poor assessment of risk. I mean, it seems it's to me just that bad banking. But let's ask why people were doing it, and that's key. They were doing it for two reasons. One is what a lot of people in the finance sector call "I'll be gone, you'll be gone." That is, it used to be that when you worked in a bank, you were there for life, pretty much. So the loans weren't paid back. You were still there when that happened. The people who were lending money in Greece thought, well, I'll have moved on to my next job by the time this, these chickens come home to roost, if, if, if they ever do. The second thing is that people thought uh, this thing might go wrong, but actually the European Central Bank will bail everyone out. And that is pretty much what happened. So we had really quite a lot of that around the financial crisis. We know that in 2008, when things started to go wrong, governments, U.S. government biggest of all, bailed out banks all over the place. So if there's that bailout, you don't have to do that kind of credit assessment anymore. The government's going to pay you back anyway or make sure you are paid back. Now, um, uh, let me, I guess I don't want to get too caught up in the, in the, Gre in the Greek dynamic. And, and I think what you're describing, the, you know, I'll be gone, you'll be gone, is sort of the, um, uh, the dynamic that we had in the, in the mortgage sector in this country where 
your originators of the loan would then turn around and sell the loan. So at the end of the day, as long as they could make that sale uh, to yep, some other right. sucker, it doesn't matter who they gave the loan to. But in the in the in the situ in the in the context of the uh, of the Greek uh, collapse, it seems to me that the other thing that was driving this was um, that when those loans were made down south, they were made in order to finance the purchase of goods from the north, and that in many respects, you know, the north was getting. Um, was getting the the sort of the the value of those loosey goosey loans from down south, because it was where the money was coming to buy their goods. That's right. So so long as the party kept going, everyone was happy. You know that uh, German banks were lending the money in the south. It was then being used to buy goods from Germany. Uh, German banks were doing well. German manufacturers were doing well. And then some people suddenly woke up one day and asked, you know, how are these guys ever going to pay the money for this? All right. So, so, so we have this situation where the financial sector is now basically is, is, is trading to itself. It has become an increasingly large portion of the economy. And I, I off the top of my head, I can't remember the number that uh, I think it was Jared Diamond in his book Collapse had talked about um, when finance gets to be a certain percentage of your GDP, uh, watch out, don't stand next to any walls, uh, yeah. because there's going to be a problem. But In Iceland, it got to be about 25% of GDP at 2007, and that ought, ought to have been a pretty big signal, you know, that there's something wrong here. And, of course, Iceland was the, the worst case of collapse when the banking crisis erupted in 2008. And in many respects, they rebuilt in a much better way, I think, and I don't, I think, I, I, my guess is you would share this opinion uh, than uh, the rest of us. But, bef but before we get to that, give us a sense of, like, why you think this happened. Like, what happened over the past 30-some-odd years that suddenly... And it seems to me that we are at a, um, you know, w some of this is somewhat unprecedented in terms of just the explosion of the financialization of an economy. Um, what, what, what accounts for it? I, I think it was a whole mixture of things. Globalization was part of it. We're very conscious of that in London, where London has always been a financial center. London has always exported uh, financial services to the rest of the world. But it's only in the last 20, 30 years that you've gone around the city and you've seen big signs and plates with Goldman Sachs, Citibank, Deutsche Bank on them. So globalization was part of it. Technology was part of it, too. There's a whole lot of activity in the finance sector today which just wouldn't have been possible uh, with the kind of technology people deployed had available to them 50 years ago. Um, that we've got better at financial mathematics has also been part of it. We couldn't have created the derivative markets, which we have uh, without it. Uh, deregulation was also part of it, and that goes into the kind of ideology uh, that took over with the election of Thatcher and Reagan, in which people said, well, perhaps markets are pretty good, and perhaps the, the more markets we have and the more activity we have in markets, uh, the better. Personally, I think markets are pretty good, but I don't think it follows from that that the more activity you have in markets, the better these markets are functioning. And and so uh, we've had this enormous growth. What what would have been? I mean, I know that um, uh, in in your mind that the the regulation. All right. Well, give me your critique of how we responded to this crisis. Well, I think. I think regulation began, right, was always part of the problem rather than the answer to the problem. And much of the complexity of the financial system was a self-reinforcing process in which we had too complex regulation. People created more complex instruments to try and manage that regulation, and it just became a spiral in which everything became more and more complicated. Now, you can see the way we that, read that into the way we've responded to the crisis, which is to say, what, what do we do? We didn't have enough regulation. Let's make it more complicated still. Now, I think that approach is not going to work. I think what we have to do is focus on two things. One is, have we got the industry structure right? And how do we align the incentives that people who work in the industry 
so that it's in their interest to produce the kind of products that people out in the rest of the economy actually want. Now, all right, how do you define regulation versus saying, have we got it uh, structured right? Because I think on some level, you know, in this country, when they were contemplating uh, Dodd-Frank and uh, things like the Volcker Rule, um, there was a, a, a pretty big critique from Occupy Wall Street, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that movement. Um, that, no, I presume it was also in, in Great Britain yep. to a certain extent. Well, uh, but there was a working group here uh, in, in New York City, a, a, a Occupy Wall Street working group, which was looking for, rather than regulation, uh, broader statutory regulation in the, uh, I guess, the generic sense rather than the specific sense. In other words, the distinction, uh, at least in the context of, uh, of American policymaking, is it is on a statutory level where you would say, we're going to separate banks from uh, investment banks, commercial banks, lending banks from investment banks. Go back to a sort of a pre-Glass-Steagall, uh, pre, uh, uh, or uh, post-Glass-Steagall, but pre-repeal of Glass-Steagall. Exactly, yep. and um, and as opposed to. Let's continue with the structure that we have, but sort of tinker around the edges with regulations that take place in uh, in the regulatory bodies. And of course, in this country, I presume you have a similar dynamic. Uh, but when regulation is proffered um, I I in this country, it then gets tied up or intimidated by corporate uh, bankers, lawyers, and then things get really messy. That, the, 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 that's true everywhere, and I'm on the same page as the people you're discussing. I think what we need to do is to have regulation that emphasizes structure and incentives rather than regulation that attempts to write enormously complicated rule books. Frankly, the writing of very complicated rule books hasn't worked in any industry it's been tried. What we need to do is get the, try and get the structure of the industry right, and if we do that, I think we can rely on market forces to do a lot of the work for us. So what does, uh, is the structure you would propose to basically, to, to primarily separate those two types of, uh, of species of banking? And then I think that's one thing, but I think that's only the beginning. Even after we've separated uh, the retail bank from the investment bank, we need to ask what do investment banks do? And what investment banks do is they give advice to corporations, they issue securities, they do asset management of your savings and mine, they make markets, and most of all, they trade on their own account. And actually, you just have to start listing these functions, and you see that all of them conflict with every other. So uh, what I would like to see would be breaking up financial conglomerates and having smaller uh, more focused firms and rather short in the chains of intermediation so we don't have everyone trading with each other all the time but actually direct connections between savers and companies and the people who invest their money in companies. So uh, even in the context of let's say commodity trading rather than just having speculators in there who have no relationship whatsoever to the underlying uh, commodity that they're trading uh, people should have some actual real-world skin in the game. I mean, because uh, commodities was just simply a, a way to make sure, ultimate, or at least in its, in its birth, was just to make sure that farmers could anticipate some type of consistent income and were not so much at the mercy of, really, I guess, the weather. Uh, yeah, and commodities are an interesting case because the way commodity markets used to be is most of the people who traded in these markets well, that actually be people who really wanted to buy and sell the product. That is, you either produced copper or you wanted to buy copper, or you, you grew wheat and you, or, or you wanted to, uh, you either grew wheat or you wanted to use wheat to make bread with. And so long as the world is like that, a little bit of speculative activity is quite a good thing because it means that there are people there who are willing to invest capital when prices are low uh, and get out again when prices are high and while they make profits out of that it stabilizes prices overall but what we now have is a world in which in most of these commodity markets the speculative trading is now much larger than the, the underlying trading from users and then you get the world in which what people are doing is not 
is essentially trying to guess what others are doing rather than what is really happening to supply and demand for the product. And that means that speculative activity is making prices a lot more volatile, not a lot less. And that's what we've seen in commodity markets over the last decade. And and that fundamentally uh, runs contrary to the purposes that at least when these markets are contemplated being established, the, the purpose is to maintain, uh, is to create less volatility as opposed to more. Yeah, that's right. Well, so how... Uh, right, and basically there are two kinds of reasons people can trade in risk. One is that you can share risk out among the community, and that's a good reason for people sharing risks. But there's a bad reason for sharing risks, which is when people are just making gambles on will the price of this go up or down or stay the same. And uh, we don't need large amounts of activity of the second kind. We really do want quite a lot of activity of the first. It's the question, uh, I mean, because, you know, we start to bump up against sort of ideological, um, um, you know, sort of pre, uh, sort of a priori principles, I guess. But, but, but in fact, uh, in, this is the, 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 this is as financialized as things have become. In other words, we've never, there's never been a time where there's been more, I guess, illusory wealth created right in the history of the world it seems to me i mean so that there is not uh, if we were to roll this back in some way we would not be going into uncharted territories it's in fact uncharted territories that we're in now and there are no principles we'd be trampling on to return back to a time where a, a government can say you know uh we have a vested interest in the functioning of our financial sector and this is dysfunctional. That's right. But remember, while you have a large stock of imaginary wealth, you have a lot of people who have no interest in having that exposed. Uh, if I if you have a if you have a Picasso on your wall, I come and point out it's a fake. I'm not doing you or anyone else any favors. But that is reality, and reality breaks in always one day around the, uh, another well i mean the, is is it i mean is that situation <laughs> like that in terms of our financial markets i mean do we all lose on some level i mean i guess maybe you know uh, the 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 great art lover uh would would feel like at least we've gotten one picasso fake picasso exposed but yep. i mean um do we all lose if 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 some of these um, if some of the illusion is taken away or 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 is it? Uh, no, we don't all lose, uh, but there's a pretty powerful group of people who know they will lose. Right, uh, and there were occasions where the gains from this were rather widely spread, as they were during the the internet boom, for example. I'm sure you had friends. I had certainly certainly did who were congratulating themselves on, on how much money they were making. Only nemesises. I never had any friends who did well. <laughs> um, but yes, and, and, uh, but not so much after 2008. Not so much after 2008. The losses there were concentrated in the, essentially in the banking sector, and they fell on bank shareholders and on taxpayers. Do you have any reason to believe that... Um, or I should maybe rephrase this: uh, Has the has the has the window of opportunity closed for these type of reforms? I mean, do we have to wait for the next implosion? I think we do. Uh, you may remember Rahm Emanuel famously said that never let a good crisis go to waste back in two thousand and eight. But that is exactly what happened. And as you're even more conscious of in the U.S. Uh, than any other country, the lobbyists have really got to work ensuring that the status quo does not change by all that much. Do you have any sense of when that next implosion happens? I mean, is there, I mean, I know that's the, uh, that's the, well, I guess it's maybe it's the $64 trillion question, not 64000 but um, I mean, do you have a sense of, of what, um, what are the predicates necessary for that type of implosion? Right. It, it's very difficult to predict particularly difficult to predict when and quite difficult to predict how another crisis is going to is going to happen and i think the two unresolved problems we have at the moment are we have a particular problem in 
uh, in Europe with the unresolved difficulties in the Eurozone. And we now have a wider problem, which people have been focusing on China in the last few months, but in relation to the extent to which a lot of ill-considered investment may have gone into emerging markets. But I sure don't want to predict where or when the next crisis is going to start. John Kay, uh, visiting professor of economics at the London School of Economics uh, and author of uh, Other People's Money. In Britain, it's master of the universe or servant of the people. And in this country, um, it is uh, the real business of finance. I appreciate your time today. We'll put a link uh, to that book at majority.fm. Uh, good to talk to you, Sam. Bye-bye.